Hey y'all, welcome to part four of my series on the Vectric software titles for the absolute beginner. Now again, before I get started, let me restate my standard disclaimer. I'm neither sponsored nor endorsed by Vectric software or any other company. I'm doing this series to help the person who has never worked with CAD or CAM software before get started on a project, finish a project, and help them improve their skills with the CAD CAM software. So with that behind us, let's go ahead and get into this week's project. And we're going to pick up where we left off in last week's project. So I'm going to go ahead over here and load my clock file that we worked on last week. And I'm going to start by answering a question that I got in the comment section for last week's video, which, by the way, if you missed it, I'll put a link up here somewhere. Now, the question I got was about these circles here at the 12, 9, 6, and 3 position when I resized them. Uh, I originally drew a, an array of 12 quarter inch circles. Then I deleted these three, resized this one to 3 eighths of an inch, then created another array of four copies total in these positions. The question I got was, why didn't I just group these four circles and increase their size that way? And that's a good question, and I'll go ahead and show you right now why I did not do that. Let's go ahead and select the group so we have all four circles here. Now, if I were to go over under Transform Objects to set selected object size, what it would attempt to do is resize the entire group. You see here I've got 10 and 3 eighths of an inch width in X and 10 and 3 eighths of an inch high in Y. It would attempt to resize the group, not the individual circles within that group. Okay, so that's why I didn't do it that way. Now let me deselect and hit close here. What I could have done instead of deleting these three here, resize this one, then create a circular array, is I could have increased the size of each of these circles individually. I'll show you how to do that now. So we'll go ahead and we'll select the group. Now in order to resize an individual circle, I have to ungroup them so that I'm working with just the individual circle. We'll do that by selecting the group, coming over here to this icon under Edit Objects, ungroup objects back onto their original layers. Now click that and you'll notice that the circles went from solid pink lines back to these pink dashed lines. Now I'll click off, then I can select each circle individually again. Okay, it's not treated as a single object. So let's say for purposes of discussion I need to increase these to half inch diameter from 3 eighths. So I'll go ahead and I'll just select one circle, come over here to resize, or set selected object size, and make sure I have link XY checked and go over here and highlight that and enter half inch. You'll see it changes to half inch down here. I hit apply and that resizes that circle. Now I can come over here and select this one and do the same thing. 0.5, hit apply, come over here, 0.5, apply here, 0.5, 
and apply. Close, click off, and there I have those circles changed to half inch diameter. I could have very well done that in the last video. What I was attempting to do was reinforce how to use Circular Copy Circular Array Tool by showing you how to do a couple of circular arrays with different quantities and different angles. I hope that answers that question. So now what I need to do, because I've just changed these to half inch, I want to go back to 3 eighths of an inch. So in order to do that, I could go back and select each one and resize them here. But I'm just going to undo the last changes I made. Now, being as vCarve, again, is a Windows program, there are about a dozen ways of doing the same thing. One is I can come up here to the Edit menu, click on it, and click on Undo Size. And you'll see the last thing I did was just undone. Another way of doing it is to come up here to the Undo icon under File Operations, click on that, and you see it undid the change to this size here. Then there is also the keyboard shortcut, which is hold down the Control button and tap Z. And it just changed the resize there. I'm going to do that again, still holding down Control and tap Z, and we undid the resize there. VCarve keeps a list of all of the changes you have made. And again, you can see here, I can go back and undo ungrouping, which I just did. And my group is reset. VCarve will keep track of how many changes you made and will allow you to undo a certain number. I'm not quite sure what that number is. I believe it will go back to 10 changes. Anyhow, so we're back to where we were before we even started. And I hope that answered that question. For now, let's go back over here to the Toolpaths tab and get into some of the options that we have that I kept referencing as would be suitable for another video later on. Well, it's later on, so let's go ahead and get into this. Now, in the through hole pocketing toolpaths, and when I click on and select that toolpath over here, you'll notice that these turn pink. They are selected. We'll go ahead and we'll get into by double clicking that toolpath title, we'll go back into the setup here. About the only two options I want to talk about on this toolpath are a pocket allowance and ramping the plunge moves. I'm not going to use either one of these options, but it is something to know about. If, for purposes of discussion, I didn't want the bit to cut exactly on this vector as we're hollowing out this hole, if I wanted to, it to cut, say, five thousandths small, smaller than this hole, I could come up here and enter a pocket allowance of 0.005. Then when I calculate the toolpath, it will cut that circle. Let me change that. That would be negative 0 0.005. That means it would cut five thousandths smaller than what this vector says to cut. If I were to leave that a positive number, it would cut five thousandths to the outside of this circle. Now, that's something that I have to be careful of. And here's why. On this hole right here, on this circle, if I were to set this to cut five thousandths of an inch smaller than this 
circle here. Because I'm using a quarter inch bit and I'm trying to drill quarter inch holes here, these vectors here would be ignored. Because what I've done is I've told the toolpath to cut five thousandths of an inch smaller than the bit's diameter. So that wouldn't work. It would not cut these at all. V-carve would give me a warning, but it wouldn't work. Now if I went out of negative into a positive pocket allowance, that means it would cut these circles five thousandths of an inch larger than what the vector says it should be. And, and that has its uses. Pocket allowance comes in real handy further down the road when you're working on inlays or if you're making through holes that need to be slightly larger than the uh, circle, say for clearance for a bolt or something of that nature. So that's a pocket allowance. 99 times out of 100, I don't use a pocket allowance at all so I leave it at zero, meaning it's going to cut exactly the size the vector tells it to. The next subject I want to get into down here is ramping plunge moves. With certain bits, this is really a necessity. With other bits, it's an option. I tend to ramp my plunge moves over a distance of at least double the bit's diameter. What ramping a plunge move will do is when the bit lifts up and comes over here to cut this hole, rather than plunging straight down, it will actually start lowering the bit at its plunge rate and moving in X and Y at the same time so that the bit lowers itself in as it starts to cut until it gets to the first pass depth. Then once that bit slowly eases in and gets to that first pass depth, then it will start cutting at its normal feed rate. Now, in a, ramp, in a uh, pocket tool path, this, depending upon how many pockets you want to do, this can slow down machining and extend machining times because you're slowing down the plunge rate of the tool and easing it into the work rather than just plunging straight down. Now, if you, the advantage of using ramps is it's easier on the tool because you're easing the tool into the work rather than just diving straight down. So there's kind of a trade off there. It's worth it in the long run, but if you have something you have to get done right now, you can, and you, you need machine time more than you need tool durability, you can shut off ramp plunge moves and it will work just fine. Now, when I said before that with some tools it's an absolute necessity, as an example, if you're using an end mill, like I have a surfacing bit. The cutter does not go all the way across the bottom of the tool. The cutter is basically just outside on the edges. I have to ramp my plunge moves over a distance of at least double that bit's diameter. Otherwise, the bit will try to lower down into the work, but with no cutter in the middle, it's going to bottom out and start burning the wood. And when I say burning, I don't mean actually catching on fire, although I guess that is a possibility. But it will leave a lot of marks and could possibly break the tool or mess up a mount or mess up your spindle. So look at your bits. If the cutter doesn't go all the way across the bottom of the bit, you will need to ramp in the plunge moves at least double that tool's diameter. Now, again, I'm not going to ramp the plunge moves in on this one because it's just not necessary with this small of a vector. So I will go ahead and close that unchanged. 
the 3 8 pocket is basically would be a repeat of what we just went over. Now, on the profile cutout, there's a lot to talk about. So we'll go ahead and we will double click the profile cutout to bring up this screen. And this is our perimeter, our outside cutout of the final clock face here. One thing I do want to talk about is doing a separate last pass. When it comes to profiles, I always do a separate last pass when, with an allowance of 0 0.01, if I can. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in just a second. What a separate last pass is, as it sits right now, this is set up to where this quarter inch end mill is going to cut out all the way through this material in four passes. Using this allowance, what it will do is the first three of these four passes, it will actually cut 0.01 inches to the outside because that's how I have it set up. So it'll cut a little bit large, 0.01 inches, 10 thousandths, to the outside of this line. Then when it gets around to the last pass, for the sake of discussion, say that it started here. When it gets back around here and it's ready to do its last pass, it'll lift up out of the work, move in that 0 0.01, and plunge back in and cut the entire profile in one pass to the correct size. The advantage of that, and the reason I do that, is if you've ever cut a profile out before, especially in something like plywood. If you look at the edge, you can sometimes see tracks and trails where the bit has cut each and every pass. So it'll start here, plunge in for the first pass, cut all the way around, get back here, plunge in, make the second pass. Well, you can actually see those lines on the edge where it made each of the previous passes. Sometimes you can see a little burn mark where the bit plunges in. Doing a separate last pass at 0 0.01 inches will eliminate that. It will cut the entire depth in one pass, removing ten thousandths of an inch. So it eliminates those burn marks, it eliminates those tracks, and gives you a nice clean cut on your edges. And that really reduces sanding, I'm here to tell you. So I almost always do a separate last pass. The situations where I can't do a separate last pass is if, we'll use our example we have here, if I'm cutting, let's imagine that this vector came down here, then went inside to cut this out, and then came back out here and continued cutting. If this area, this inside cut here, is less than 10 thousandths larger than our uh, tool, it will not come in and make those first three passes. It will wait and on the separate last pass, try to cut the full thing out at full depth. So, when you're setting up to run a outside profile cutout, make sure that this allowance and your tool diameter is less than the gap you're trying to put that tool through. Okay? That'll prevent it from trying to force that tool all the way through in one pass. So make sure if you're going to do an inside profile or cut inside into a gap, make sure that your allowance and your tool diameter are smaller than the gap you're trying to cut. Okay? Adding tabs to the tool path. I do add tabs uh, quite often actually. And what I prefer to use are 3D tabs. 
Let me show you the difference here and you can see on this little sketch. Up here we select the length of the tab. I usually use half inch wide tabs. Then the thickness of the tab on this thin material I went with uh, eighth of an inch thick. If it's three quarter inch material I go with a quarter inch thick tabs. That's how much material is left behind when that tab is cut. And I use 3D tabs. Now if you can see here in this little sketch a 3D tab the bit will come along in its cutting direction and when it gets to a tab location rather than stopping and your bit lifting up out of the work moving over then plunging back down rather than doing that the tool will come along and it'll slow down a little bit but the Z will kick in and lift the tool to the thickness of the tab when it gets to that thickness it'll start plunging down and come and come down the other side leaving kind of a pyramid shaped tab rather than a square one it speeds up the machining in that the two, the X and Y don't stop to create that tab they keep going they do slow down to the plunge rate and then once it's lifted to the proper height it plunges down again at the plunge rate so I do use tabs I use 3d tabs let's go ahead and edit the tabs using these settings so we've got a check mark here my tabs are going to be half inch long they're going to be an eighth of an inch thick I'm going to use 3d tabs let's edit them we'll go ahead we'll click add tabs now because there's a check mark right here first tab at the machining start point it placed my first tab right here you'll see that square with the T in it that's that is a tab you'll also notice my cursor has a plus sign and it's got a little drawing up above and to the right of that showing uh, kind of a top view of a tab now if I put it over this tab you'll see how it turns to a the greater than less than sign with an X in the middle that's telling me that I can delete that tab or move that tab I'm gonna put my cursor over it the that plus sign right over it click and hold down and I'm gonna drag it off that corner I don't like to put tabs in corners I prefer to put them somewhere f out in the flat where I can sand it easily and the same holds true if I'm on if I'm doing a curved surface I try to put it as far outside where I can get to it with the sander to clean it up as I can I do not put tabs on inside curves well I try to avoid it now on something of this size I'll probably go with um, two tabs on each side just to keep it secure until I come back and cut them out so the way that I'll, I'll do that is I've moved that first tab there I'll bring it back over here and when that plus sign gets close to the vector I can add a tab to that check mark appears and I just click my left click and it adds the tab then I'll come up over here add a tab add a tab and we'll do these down here so I have two per side and they're not in any place specific they're not evenly spaced that's really not a necessity to me I think I would probably move this one up in there though to get it away from the corner that's more than enough to keep this piece secure after, while it's being cut out and after it's been cut out now if I wanted to totally get rid of all of these tabs and start over I could just go down here and click this button if I wanted to delete a specific tab I come in here put my cursor over it click and it's gone I need to put it back so click and there it is so I have my tabs created okay then we'll hit close so we have our tabs added and you can see 
the T here. I'm going to talk about ramping in my plunge moves again here, and I tend to do this on profiles a lot. I'll uh, put a check mark in add, ramp, add ramps to toolpath. I prefer to use a smooth ramp over a distance of again at least double the end mills diameter so in this case we'll go 0.5 and again this is simply to ease the tool into the work rather than plunge straight down it just it's easier on the tool the tool life is extended that way now some folks prefer to do ramp it at an angle at uh, say 45 degrees that means if, if I were to do it this way the tool will come over here and get ready to plunge in and start moving the X or Y depending on uh, which is the appropriate axis and it'll move at such a rate that the tool is plunging into the work at a 45 degree angle some folks prefer to do that I would really go ahead and go with a known distance that way I'm sure that in the case of using a tool that doesn't have a cutter all the way across the bottom I'm sure that the trailing edge of that bit is going to start cutting away the inside of the material before that center section with no cutter touches the top of the material I'm not going to get into leads or order or start at right now. I am going to make sure my sharp external corners is selected. Then I will go ahead and calculate this tool path. Warning me the tool will cut through the material. We know that. We want it to. We'll click OK. And it has recalculated the tool path. Now if we come up here, let me drag this down if we come up here and look turning it off to the side by using my left mouse button we can see the four steps this bits gonna take to cut through the material but when we get to my tab here it's going to come along and cut and again it'll lift up till it gets to that 1 8 inch tab thickness then come back down the other side. The axis will not stop moving across the X in this case. It'll just slow down to the plunge rate of the bit, then take off again. Now let me go back to a straight Z view, and if we come in from this angle, we can also see that the first three passes are to the outside of the vector the last pass is cutting right on the vector that's that do a separate last pass it'll come along and do the final pass at the full thickness of the material let's go ahead and preview that tool path and we'll see it cut out gave us nice sharp corners and there are my 3d tabs People have asked me about tabs a lot because in my videos I tend not to use tabs. The reason I don't use tabs in my videos is so I can come along and double click on my waist to remove it. Well with these tabs in place I can't double click and in fact let me do it and show you why. Deleting from the selected point would delete all the material. I can't delete the waste because I have those tabs. It's all still connected. To delete the waste, you will need to create a temporary simulation without tabs. So that explains why I don't use tabs in my videos.
That is so I can come along and delete the waste and show you the completed project. Now that's something to remember if you are going to save a preview image to send a client or customer. Do a simulation without the tabs. Save those, pic those preview images. Then come back to your profile cutout toolpath and add your tabs before you go out and save G-code, go out and start cutting. Okay? We'll reset the preview. Speaking of saving G-code and cutting, this will be the final thing we'll go over in this video. In the last video I said we have three toolpaths here. They all use the same end mill. We are ready to generate G-code, save it to a flash drive, and take it outside and start cutting. The way to do that is through the use of this icon right here, Save Toolpath. Now, because all three of these toolpaths use the same tool, I can put a check mark right here. It turns on all of the toolpaths so we can see them. I can click on that icon and that opens up the Save Toolpaths form. I've got a check mark here, Output all visible toolpaths to one file, meaning this is going to take all three of these toolpaths and create just one file that I will load into my control software and run. If I had a vCarve toolpath down here, I would not be able to do that because it's a different end mill. It's a different bit. I would have to do separate files. So if you're using the exact same bit, have no tool changes, you can select them all, click the Save Toolpath icon, output all visible toolpaths to one file. Now, if that sounds a little daunting to you and you would rather have separate toolpath files, one for the through hole, one for the th uh, 3 8 pocket, and one for the profile cutout, you could certainly uncheck one and it will remove from the list. But I am going to output it to one file. Down here is the section that confuses a lot of beginners and that is the post processor. To put it simply, the post processor is, for lack of a better term, the language your control software speaks. If you're using a XCARVE, it's going to need to run a specific type of file that XCARVE understands. If you're using a Shapeoko, it needs a type of file that it's going to understand. If you're using a CNC Shark, etc., etc., etc. You can click this menu right here and you can see there are a lot of post processors and more being added every day. So, my advice would be, for instance, we have here Shapeoko Inch, Shapeoko Millimeters, depending upon whether you're using inches or millimeters. Here they are for ShopBot. We'll go down the list a little bit and see what we get. If there's, yes, there's an X-carve millimeter and X-carve inch. You will need to use the post processor for your CNC router. I'm using Mach 3 as my controller software. So I always, when I'm cutting two-dimensional, flat, not on my rotary axis, I always use Mach 2 slash 3 arcs inch, which creates a TXT file. 
That's the file I'm going to take out, load into Mach 3, and run my CNC. Now some of you probably noticed output direct to machine. Your CNC must be set up to accept G-code directly from vCarve in order for this to work. If it's not set up to do so, this will not work whether you put a check mark in here or not. Then we'll go ahead. I've got my tool paths selected. I've got to, I want to output them all to one file. Save the tool paths to file. I will put it in my I will put it here. When vCarve goes to save the G code, it takes the first toolpath on the list, and that's what it calls or wants to name the file name. I will change the file name 99, 99 times out of 100. Let's put one quarter and mill clock face. I always put in the tool, then the name of the tool path. If I were V carving with a 90 degree V bit, up here on, at the beginning I would type in 90 degree, then the name of the tool path. So I've got my post processor, I've got my file title, and I'll click Save. Now I can come down here to that folder, and here we have this TXT file. Now I won't say all because not all. Most G code files can be opened in Notepad if you're using a PC. So I'll double click that to open it up, and here we see the G code. This is the code that Mach 3 is going to send to my CNC router to physically cut out this part. Now I'm not going to sit here and try to go through this G code and explain to you what everything is. What's needed to know is everything here in parentheses is a comment for you to be able to read out on the control software. It is ignored by the controller. It knows that this is a comment for us to read. You can see here that this was created today for Mach 2.3 from Vectric. It gives me the material size and then goes down a list. These are the tool paths that are used in the file. The through hole pocket, the 3 8 pocket, and the profile cutout. Tools used in this file, one quarter inch end mill. Then we get into where we're going to start and stop, which tool path it's going to cut first using which tool. Then these are the instructions to the controller itself. Okay? You can go through your entire CNC hobby career, for lack of a better term, and never look at this again. Never see it, never need to get into it, not even care. Or, if you're interested, and it does come in handy at times, you can get into learning a little bit of G-code and figuring out what certain things do, what certain commands do. I know a little bit. I don't know a lot, and I'm not going to attempt to teach anybody really much of anything here. About the only thing that stands out to me right now, other than the few obvious things that I've pointed out, is for instance, right here, we have F50, right here. That's telling me the F stands for feed rate. So the feed rate is 50, whatever I have my controller set up for. In my case, it would be inches per minute. And the same thing down here. The feed rate is 50. This here is a Z move. 
you can see the Z right there, F20. That tells me it's a plunge rate of 20. The Z is moving down to 0.1262 at a rate of 20 inches per minute. So I just did something I said I wasn't going to do. And we'll call that an end of that. Anyway, that's the G code. This is the file that we will save onto a flash drive, take outside, plug into our controller software, and machine this clock face. Again, you may never need to open a piece of G code. Then again, you may get a little bit comfortable with going in and modifying uh, feed rates or plunge rates or moving zero points or things of that nature. I know how to do that. I generally don't use it. I, if I need to make a modification like that, I'll make it here in vCarve. That way the file is changed and I don't have to go back and move a zero point every time I want to cut that file. It's, it's done here. So with that G code saved, we can close this, uncheck all these. We're ready to go outside and cut out this project. Mount a piece of material onto the CNC table and get machining. I'm going to go ahead and call this an end to this video. If you got anything out of this video at all, or if you have any questions, comment, concerns, by all means, please leave a comment in the comment section below. If you don't want to leave a public comment, head over to my website, marklindsaycnc.com, and click that Contact Us page, and ask your question there. I do look at every uh, comment that comes to me through the Contact Us page. So I will get it, I will see it, I will read it, and I will answer you if I can be of any help at all. And if I can't be of any help at all, I'll let you know that too. <laughs> if you got anything at all out of this video, please, I'd appreciate a thumbs up down there below. If you'd like to continue to follow along with this beginner series, uh, please consider subscribing to my channel. If you know somebody who would benefit from this series, feel free to share it to your social media. Whether you do that or not, whether you subscribe or not, as always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching, and y'all take care.